You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. You know what the thing is, James, with me that really hurts me the most is I got shot, so I'm a victim, but I feel that I am to blame for it. So when I look in my mum and dad's eyes and my son's eyes, I feel like I owe them so much because I got shot. Do you know what I mean? So I feel like I own my trauma though. So then they pulled us in a room, pulled the curtain around and they're saying there's a bullet lodged in my spine. L1, T12, it's hit three bones on the way down and it's lodged. And then they've said the, the words that hit me the most hardest is uh, you're never going to walk again. I was like, mum, I need to go wee. She's like, yeah, okay, cool, just go. I said, what? I said, but help me out the bed. She's like, Darren, you're not, you don't get it, do you? You're paralyzed from your waist down. You got a catheter on. I was like, mum, a catheter is for older people, like when I see them in the homes, not, not judging anyone, just saying. And she's like, you've got a catheter on and you're going to have to have a catheter for the rest of your life. I was like, shit, man. That's when reality hit me hard, man. And, and I just remember having a little uh, iPad when they first come out and I was looking for to commit suicide and going to Switzerland to commit suicide. I had some mad dark times in there and I put on a lot of weight. I put on, I come from 21 stone. Within seven months, I put on 11 and a half stone. I was eating, I was lying about my eating. I was secretly eating, asking people to bring stuff in. I remember getting a ferret band, tying it to the back of the um, hospital bed. And boy, I just, I just remember yanking my neck, saying, please God, let me go. Please go let me go. But that's that's the reality of this. So you try to kill yourself? Yeah, uh, twice. When you were trying to kill yourself in the hospital, what was going through your mind five minutes, ten minutes before? And that I'm making it better for everyone around me. I'm not a burden. Yeah, it's sad to think that, isn't <laughs> it? But you don't really it doesn't really take away your pain. What it does is pass it on. There you go. So then mm. that comes back to how much more trauma I'm about to put on my loved ones again. How much heart f- felt, heartache can they take? They blame themselves maybe. There you go. They couldn't have helped and you it, anymore. And it's nothing to do with them. People need to understand the fucking misery that causes by holding a gun and a knife. If you hold a gun and a knife, you are a coward. You are you, a shite bag. My message is so powerful. I just want to say whatever you, whatever you are going through, and remember, if you are at rock bottom, there's only one way and it's up. And when you start climbing that ladder and using it as a process more than a negative outlook, you're going to survive. Boom, we're on. Let's yes. go. Ready. And today's guest, we've got fucking Darn Awell. Yes, James. How, How are you doing, you, man? I'm good, man. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you for inviting me on. Yeah, thanks for coming yeah. on. No, it's, it's powerful, man. It's going to be powerful. Yeah, you've got a powerful story. Yeah, very powerful. London boy. London born. Bread. Shot three times. Yeah. Paralyzed. From the waist down. Ended up over 30 stone. Yeah, 32 and a half. In the hospital for over two years. Nurses cleaning up your shit, your piss. Basically. And now here you are, mate. You walked up the stairs here to get That's here, it. and you've lost fucking over ten stone. Yeah. You're flying. You're sending positive messages. You're going round schools, going round prisons, changing life. You're yes. using that fuel, the pain of the past, to now making some positive changes yeah. for the future. I love that. Yes, no, thank you. I appreciate it. So, how have you been? I've been good. You know, it's been a powerful year. Obviously, with the so-called pandemic, you still power through. Do you know what I mean? I think is how you look at life. That's what really makes a difference. How you personally yourself looks at life. Yeah. So that's what that's what counts. Got to take the good with the bad. Hundred percent. Got to keep our heads. There's always more good when you weigh up the bad. Yeah, definitely. Always go back to the start with my guest brother. Where you grew up and how it all began. So basically, I grew up in Croydon um, area, South Norwood, to be precise. Um, Yeah, South London has probably got (laughs) that. It's crazy because South London's got like a a relatively good rep in the sense of like. A lot of so-called people are come from South London, from where I'm from. And there's always a story behind it. So when you go out somewhere and you say, oh, people meet you, they're like, where are you from? You're like, say South London, they're like, oh. So like, they're a bit taken back or they want to be your friend because it's like a cool thing that you're from South London. How was your schooling and stuff? Do you know, it was, I got, I was good at school till I got to probably year seven. So I always wanted to be seen and loud and a bit bossy, but, with my dad being Nigerian, my mum being English, my dad weren't tolerating the bad behaviour. So 
I think I was in year seven and I said to the geography teacher, oh, that's a liberty. And I remember shouting it out in all the class laughing. And then within about, I was suspended. And you know, you got to sit down and wait for your parents to come down. My dad come down with my uncle and less than 24 hours later, I'm in Nigeria. <laughs> so my dad has literally said to me, what does liberty mean? Took me home, said to me, explain to, explain to me what liberty means. Remember, I'm in year seven. I didn't know what liberty means. But when I got to Nigeria, I, I, re I realized liberty means at your own freedom. That freedom I lost. So I got sent back to Nigeria because of my behavior. And it's more of answering back and coming from an area where it's like fighting all the time. So that's what it was for me. So what, how long were you in Nigeria for? For the first time was like maybe eight, nine months. And that was like when I turned from 12, no, year seven. So year seven, yeah, 12 to 13. Or I had turned 13 over there. And my life, oh, it was crazy, man. It was like, it was like I'm coming from England. And then I'm going to Nigeria and then I'm getting water. I'm, I remember I said to my dad, dad, um, I put the taps on, there's no water coming out. He goes, this is called life, Darren. This is what you're going to learn, the value of life. And I'm not going to lie, it taught me a lot to this day. And not only that, I got to meet my grandparents out there that I didn't, that hadn't been to England to visit me. They had been to England before, but they'd gone back to Nigeria. So it's like a life, that, that it turned my life around. So was he doing that for punishment or to learn you? Punishment. To understand life. To understand more? life, to appreciate what I do have when I'm in England. And for me, that was like a big head turn because not turning on the taps. And I remember the time where I've gone to the light switch and I've turned on the light switch. And I'm like, there's no, there's no light. And I was like, dad. He's like, he goes, this is what I mean. You're going to learn. And then like, within two weeks later, he just left me there. So he's gone. He's gone back home. But that's the lesson that I did need. need. I had some, there's some huge actions that implemented on my life throughout that it taught me like discipline and stuff and to appreciate stuff and I think it kept it's still with me now so that the stuff that I don't take advantage for turning on the light going to the not going to the world to get water but it taught me a lot of discipline how was that then was there any resentment against your dad at that time at first because I'm young I was like oh why did you send me I was thinking my, I was scared of my dad my dad's very strict and very direct and very strong so if even with words he's strong so he didn't have to hit me his words was powerful as a hit so whether it was a, like me getting hit when I was growing up or, or disciplined or him saying a strong word, I'll be real with you. It's probably one of the reasons why I'm still walking today because yeah. later on, as this goes on, I'll tell you something that one of the reasons when I come out of hospital, how I started to walk again. So what were you doing when you were in Nigeria? Were you schooling or was you just yeah, working? My, so I was having a life at Riley because my, <laughs> my cousins, when my dad went, my cousins were, my, cousin, my uncle was a pilot. So I got to stay with them. So then I was getting like, we had drivers. So he's going to a place called Mr. Biggs, which is the equivalent of McDonald's. Mm -hmm. So then I'm living that life. Then my granny was like, Darren, you're not here for that. Took me out of um, like a private school in Nigeria and put me in a mainstream school. Now that time I went into the mainstream school on a way, this is my first encounter on a, on a, on a bus on the way to school. There had been some local robbers. Now the police had come and no lie, they shot them. But I didn't see them actually get shot, I saw a commotion, I'm only young, there's a shooting, I'm thinking, wow, what's going on here? And then I've gone back to school, so the next day, the bodies that I saw, like the figures that I saw, are laying in the gutter dead. So for me, I was like, this is, this is crazy, this is, well, like I've seen death. So at an early stage, I saw death, and I was just like, I was taken back. But then I was thinking, okay, cool, because I've always been that strong man, it's not me, but so they're laying in the gutter. So even when I was going home, I was thinking, they're laying in the gutter. Like, is that normal? But it was normal. There was robbers, whatever they'd done, they, they thing. So that experience for me has an impact on me daily. What did you do when you come come home? So when I come back home, I was good. I was on a good path. Were you pretending to be good so you didn't get sent back? Yeah, or because... Were you good? We, yeah, I was, I was pretending to be good, <laughs> but I didn't want to go... I didn't want to go back to Nigeria. But I'll be honest with you, seeing my grandparents and learning the discipline and the culture and seeing that the the way they um like the way they serve their food and cook their food and they preserve their food and stuff like that it made me want to see my parents, my grandparents again but shortly long after that I was back in trouble just like silly things like being naughty and like disobeying my dad and getting silly things like he warned me like don't get a moped 
because they're dangerous. And me being Darren, oh, I wanted a moped. So I used to hide this moped in the back of my granddad's garage. I got a spare key off my granddad. He only lived like um, 30 doors away from my house. So <laughs> I got a key, a spare key for the garage. Got it cut. Don't ask me how I knew how to do this. Like, I, I was just thinking on the spot. I used to park the moped in the garage because my granddad never used the garage. And my dad was like, have I seen you on the bike today, Darren? Like, no, not me. It must be someone else. Okay, cool. But I think he always knew because obviously he's a, he's a man. So he's probably done these things as he's younger as well. But um, having two parents consistent in my life has been a blessing because it's taught me a lot of morals in my own relationships with uh, my family and people around me and the closeness. Do you know what I mean? And I think this day and age, a lot of people, they're not together with each other. Yeah. What did you do your younger years for work? So my younger years, so basically my younger years, I, so I used to work in my dad's computer shop when I was in trouble, which was every weekend <laughs> <laughs> and every day. I remember, so the journey from the house would take in a car about 20 minutes. My dad would say, I'll see you at the shop. I said, what? I said, but you're going to the shop, daddy. I'll see you at the shop. So he said, get on the bus for an hour and a half, go, get, go to the shop, come back from the shop. he leave the shop, go home and say, I'll see you, see you at home. So I used to spend three hours commuting on a weekend. That was my punishment because I didn't I didn't listen to him. So that was I spent a lot of time doing lines as well and <laughs> holding up the world. So holding up the world is means you stand against the wall, stand stand near the wall with your hands up, and every time they go low, he used to say, "Listen, if they drop, you're gonna get you're in trouble." So I said, like, "Oh, cool." And I remember writing lines. So like the Bart Simpson lines, "I must not, I must yeah, not." I must, yeah. That was me mm -hmm. every time. And he, Darren must not do this. Darren must not do that. And I used to think, "Oh man, it's too much, man." Have you any brothers or sisters? I got a younger brother. How old are you? He's twenty, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, mm -hmm. twenty-nine. But he's a he's he's a good boy. He's a good man. He's a powerful man, and um. I'm ever so blessed to have him because not realizing, I always, you know, when you have someone younger, you yeah. always look at that's like my little brother, not realizing there's probably six or seven years between us, but he'll always be my little brother because I've seen him grow and I really appreciate his growth and not going to take like the area we're from taking on the roads. And I think his biggest turnout was when, for me, when his friend got stabbed, um, it's been 10 years, a boy called Charms. And I remember him screaming down the phone hysterically um, that took a big impact on his impact on his friendship group, and that was probably the first time I probably heard something like other than being in Nigeria, like in England though. But getting stabbed, that was so close to home. That was his best friend. When I mean best friends, the group of friends that he's with has stayed together ever since. So did I? He died, man. Unfortunately, yeah. which is 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 crazy because so, he had so much talent. Yeah, shit, fucks with your head, and it does. Did that affect your brother? for it, a long time it still affects you when you lose something like that does. or somebody like that it's, it still plays in your mind something will trigger it whether it's a year 10 years yeah. 20 years it definitely does because short after I got shot so it was like a double whammy his friend has, has been his friend took a knife attack and passed and then his older brother gets shot and then the journey there is just like it's impactful towards my whole family man and even though I, you know, you know what the thing is, James, with me, that really hurts me the most is, I got shot, so I'm a victim, but I feel that I am to blame for it. So when I look in my mum and dad's eyes and my son's eyes, I feel like I owe them so much because I got shot. Do you know what I mean? So I feel like I own my trauma though. I own the trauma. So going into it, I don't, I didn't even tell my, I haven't told my son to this day. I've been shot either and Why? I don't I don't intend to because it's my trauma I want to own it do you know what I mean I don't I don't want my son to grow up with I'm going to get this person or try and find a person that done this to my dad and number two I don't want him to grow up and think oh my dad's a gangster because there's nothing gangster about getting shot there's mm -hmm. nothing gangster about picking up a knife or even doing a shooting I think you're a clown if you pick up any type of weapon to endanger someone's life and from an early stage my dad always said to me if you can't have a one-on-one -on -one with someone and women with your bare hands, you're not a man. Yeah. You don't need weapons to go and fight. And it's lifeless, man. Let's be honest, the amount of death that's going on and despair in people's family, because like I said, from my heart, it doesn't stop here, man. The trauma is with me every day. Like the trauma is with my mum. When I get a text from my mum, I can show you on my phone. Five o'clock every day, son, good morning. Just need to know you're okay. That has not stopped. Yeah. When I leave the house, Son, make sure you message me when you get in. I'm 37 years of age. 
that is impacting my life and my mum's and my dad's and my brother down to the point even when I come in here let me know how the flight is obviously they curtis things but it's more the so there's more to it than more being to it. showing love and making sure you're okay it's just something at the back of their yeah, mind that because they don't want to lose they've them. had that phone call yeah. listen your son's been shot it could potentially yeah. be dead and I always say a gangster is a weak man Tell Thank another you. weak man what to do. Thank Listen, but when you actually, I speak to a lot of bad men, and or well, potentially, yeah. and the when you break it all down, you you do see the vulnerability. You see the shit that went that's, through in their past. That's, and, what, it, that's what it is. It's a bad upbringing, and, and they want someone forward. to blame. Same as drug dealers. If you're selling drugs, you're wow. part of the problem. There's kids as young as ten taking drugs. You're part of that. People dying, prostitution. Thank you're you. part of that connection. So people say, "Oh, don't touch it or don't do yeah. this." You're still part of the connection. Thank if you. you've got other people to do it, so and in but if you don't know that, yeah. it's hard if you're in that life because you do. And we say it all the time, a product to an environment. Yeah. It is hard to listen to others, but when you've actually lived it and you've experienced it and you've been there, you go, "Listen, I'm fucking yeah. telling you. Do I'm you telling want that? You. Your mum to come up crying, or your mom. dad, your brother? Listen, we're everyone. You in a gang yourself. We in that gang yeah. culture where you're a violent man. But yourself. the gang's not going to be with you. Yeah. When push comes to shove, they're gone. Yeah, but were you? Were you yeah. in a gang then? No, I never in a gang. So when my incident happened, I was like on and off the roads. I'll be honest, um, here and there, do you know what I mean? But I was never a gang person. So I had a job. I worked in the post office um, for seven and a half years. I had a job at the time of my shooting and stuff like that. But obviously being around the area that I'm from, I met a lot of people that done whatever. I was involved, whatever, here and there. But I've never, I'm not a violent person. I never condone hurting or touching everyone or robbing anyone. That's never been my thing. Middleman, make drinks here and there. It's sim something that's easy, but whether you're the middleman, the main man or any man, listen, that game is a mugs game, man. I can't lie because you either go to jail, yeah? Or you're going to get robbed or you may not even wake up in the morning because all the, whenever they catch you, that someone, there's no loyalties no more. So how was your life leading up to the shooting then? Oh, it was good, man. I was buying and selling cars. So I had to always had a, I had a loophole because I knew so many people so I can buy and sell cars. I didn't even need to sell my cars on Auto Trader. So I had so much friends, so cool, well, let me go back, associates around me that were buying cars and stuff. Um, cars, um, I worked in a post office and then my friends showed me about scrap metal. And me, I was always a man, like an entrepreneur type of brain. Like I had something that I had something, once I do something, I'm fixated on it. So my friend said to me that one day, come, come, let's go scrap metaling. I said, like, what's scrap metaling? I didn't get it. He's like, come, come, come. Jumped in the van, done a day with him. And we got like 500 pounds. I was like, oh. for people leaving out washing machines, free, like microwaves and this, that, the other. He's, he's showing me how to break the non, no, take the non ferrous down and weigh it in and do it separate. Then I, then I pulled off a job. I remember going to the hotel in Croydon. I said, oh, um, what if I bring, like, what are you doing with all the baths and the sinks? He's like, well, we're getting rid of it. I said, but you've got a big skip. It's going to cost you money. He's like, well, if you can get me five vans down here now, yeah, you can have the job. So I went to the scrapyard and asked five people, come with me. I've got a job. Listen, I was getting maybe seven to 10 grand out of all their scrap metal. You're talking taps, the copper, yeah, the sinks. Thanks. And then I took it up every day. So I used to get up at four o'clock in the morning, go scrapping till 5.30 in the morning, have a van full, yeah? And then go to the gym, cause I was trying to lose, I was very big then. I was quite big to be fair. I was quite fat to be fair. <laughs> gotta, nah, you know, I can't, the best way not, yeah, you know, there's yeah. no point in me trying to beat around the corner, yeah. I was fat. And then, then I thought, you know what I need to do? So do the gym. This is going to help me burn weight when I'm lifting the metal. Then go to the gym, stop, finish about six o'clock, shower in the gym, get to post office for 7.30, do a 24, 24 and a half hour sh um, shift a week. So that probably about five, five or four hours a day. And then that was it. Then I used to wait to about 3.30, no, three o'clock, weigh, weigh in the metal. So I had a good routine. So I was always working. Before the post office job, I was... Um, in uh, Job Centre Plus, working in Job Centre Plus. So I always, my dad, my mum and my dad are hard workers. They've always taught me to work for the money. That money doesn't come easy, but they've always taught, my dad's always told me one crucial thing, do not chase money. And till today, I understand why. He said, money will chase you. He goes, the more you chase it, the more it's going to run. If you be the flow, money will come to you. And he's told me one key thing out of everything is save your money, invest your money. And that's where a lot of people go wrong these days. These kids, they see this Instagram life and what they're not showing you is some of these people could have done investment or had ham, like a big investment handed down from their family, like premium bonds or stuff like that. 
then they use it on stuff, material things, and all of a sudden you want to do it. Or you want to sell drugs now because that rapper says that or that. That rapper doesn't sell drugs. That rapper, that rapper sells records. Yeah? That word sell drugs. So that's where it is for me. Yeah. But you just got to keep, again, your dad seems like an educated man who try to keep level-headed, understand yeah. how violent London can be in the, the crime, but there's still a lot of opportunities in yeah. London, just like anywhere, especially if he's out grafting, if you're working. So when you're going through all that, then working hard and just trying to make a quick earner. Yeah. The night you get shot, what happened with that experience? That was like, if I'm honest, I don't know, man. It was, it's crazy because, so I'm at the back of the van. I've got, there's a person approach me with a mask on. He's like, give me the money. I was like, what money are you talking about? And then I've turned around, sorry, it's pitch back dark. He's like, give me the money. I'm like, what money? And then I've lost my temper. He's shot me. So I had a, a wound across here. Just like, you know, like a skin wound. I grabbed the person by the throat. I didn't freeze. Maybe if I froze, I'd probably, maybe I wouldn't have been in this situation now. Maybe I've been walking. Maybe I wouldn't have been paralyzed, but then maybe I would have been dead. I didn't freeze. I hit out. And then by that time, two other cars were parked, not far away to say, a few meters away. And then two other people, uh, four people come out of a car, then another four people come. You're getting rushed, punched, kicked, punched, kicked. You can't feel them. It's like proper, like, it's a little flicks. You can't, cannot feel it. I'm not really registering that guy's got a gun. Cut a long story short. They're like, I'm going to kidnap you. You're coming with me. I know you got money. I know you got money. So I took off the, I had like a Louis Vuitton bag, you know, one of them messenger bags, zipped in my jacket. So I'm thinking, okay, take it. Take it, just take it. So I've got it off my neck, but he's grabbing my this bag so hard, it's you know, it's cutting into my neck. So I'm having like these bruised kind of marks. In the end, I said, look, just take it. Like wherever you come for, just take it, take it, take it, take it. I'm scared in it. I'm not gonna lie because boy, you got now. There's like eight of you anyway. And I remember my, one of my dad saying, whatever you do, just punch or hit someone because that way you got your man. So whether you your friend get them or the police get them, that's someone laid down. That's your person. Done it hit out but there's only so much hit now you've got fresh hands fresh feet hitting you kicking you punching you and before you know it, I just wanted it to end I'll be honest I just wanted it to end so bad got to a point where I'm walking with a person and I just remember seeing this lamppost and I just bear hugged it with all my life and I just started screaming as loud as I could and um, he shot again and it missed it went through the fence and he hit the other someone that he was with and then I've Done it. So now it's broke free. I've screamed. A girl's come running down the stairs, screaming, screaming, screaming. It's like it's weird. It's happening slow but fast, like at the same time. So, like I've I've seen the girls like as I'm laying on the like as now I'm getting kicked and punched, and a man's come running out from the gate. Before I know it, they're about to they they've now broke free. So I'm I'm free now. So me, I'm walking off and saying I'm gonna catch you. I'm in anger now. I'm gonna catch you. Everything. I don't know who's done it. There's all masks. I can't tell you what color they are, what they look like, or anything. And I'm just like I'm gonna find out who this is. Watch. I'm just shouting in anger. The, the person has run up in my run up to my back. So say that's my back here. They put the gun in the back. They let it go. And instead of going through my chest, which is here. It didn't. It went down and ricocheted into my spine. I'm gonna be honest with you. I didn't know what. I didn't know how effective the spine was till uh, till at least eight hours after my injury. Mm -hmm. So now I'm laying on the floor. I'm calling one of my friends on her phone, saying, "Look, I think I've been shot, but maybe I've been stun gun because there's no blood." And I, this is this is the reality of it. I'm not. That's not my life. So for me, when I was on the floor, I remember. It's, you're, you're going to think this sounds weird, but you know when Phil Mitchell in these standards gets shot, this is all I can say. Is, he's like, ah, oh, loads of blood and all this. And, and you're just like, well, he's, he's got shot. You can see he's been shot, but obviously it's the TV. There wasn't, there was a drip of blood about that much sitting on the floor. So I don't think I've been shot, but literally as I'm laying on the ground now, my from my toes to my chest here is going numb. And it's going numb so quick. Like, it, it, like I'm having to lay out on the floor. So now I've had to lay down because it's so numb and heavy, my body. But I'm thinking, this has got to be a stun gun. This is no way on this earth. So I'm like, all right, just, I'm ringing my friend, just get me to my mum's, get me to my mum and dad's. I'll be all right, it's cool. Like, I'll be all right. We, we'll deal with this later on. No, man. It's at 8.20, I hugged my mum. I was going out. 8.30, when I drove down the road, 10 minutes later, I'm shot. I'm nearly dying on the floor and... Oh man, and just you know what I was more scared of, if I'm honest, the phone call that someone's gonna call my mum and dad and say, because I'm their child, and 
in anyone's uh, life, and I spoke to my dad about life before because I'm 28 at the time, and um, he said, your children never go before you. And that rung bells in my head. That's the honest truth. Did you think that kept you alive at that point? Yeah, because I'll tell you what kept me alive is, uh, I don't know, man, it's a number of things. My mum, my dad, and it's Cam, my son. Um, How old was your son at the time? Two, two. So, it's not that so, it's, you know, what kept me alive, it kept, what kept me alive was, I can't die, man. I, I, it's not, it's not my journey to die. So, I just wanted to tell me when I get into the hospital that I, I've been stung on it and you're froze, your body's just froze, it will unfreeze soon. Oh man. And then I get to hospital, I'm, I'm getting blue lighted. Sorry, let me go back to the blue light. So I'm in the hospital, I'm in the ambulance and the ambulance people are talking over me. And I'm saying, I'm starting to worry now. Adrenaline's like it's, ki- like it's gone now. Like this is me now. I'm like, what's happened? What's happened? Why are you not telling me nothing? They're cutting off my clothes. But you've got to imagine, I can't feel them cutting off my clothes. I can see them when I'm looking over the, the mask. They're cutting off my clothes. Why? Why are you cutting off my clothes? Sir, you're going to be okay. And then I'm hearing blue lights and then I'm hearing screams. And then I'm just, a number of things and they hit you with morphine. So now I'm all over the place. Like I get to the outside the hospital. I look around. There's loads of people that I know. Why are they all here? And then it dawns on me, man. Like I'll get rushed in from the ambulance to a room. I'm in ICU now, uh, which is the highest unit. Oh man, my mum and dad are there. Shit. My mum and dad are there and they're just like, you've been shot. I said, okay, cool. But then I got a rush to go get to CT scan, an MRI scan. All these scans are going on. So then they pulled us in a room, pulled the curtain around, and they're saying there's a bullet lodged in my spine. L1 T12 is hit three bones on the way down, and it's lodged. And then they've said the the words that hit me the most hardest is, uh, "You're never gonna walk again." So from that, from there and then, from the get go. With the spinal cord injury being so damaged from the bullet, so it's from the shot and the, whatever the bullet lets out when it goes in, the damage to the bones and the spine is affected. Um, I didn't know how to take it in, man. I just pumped morphine. I remember pumping this morphine, just like hand on the button, just pumping, 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 pumping. And then the next day was like a hard hitter, man, because I'm gone. Um, I said to my mum, she's up the next day, oh, I need to go wee. She's like, what? She said, oh, no, no, she said, sorry, let me go. She didn't say what. I said, I was like, mum, I need to go wee. She's like, yeah, okay, cool, just go. I said, what? I said, but help me out the bed. She's like, Darren, you're not, you don't get it, do you? You're paralyzed from your waist down. You got a catheter on. I was like, mum, a catheter is for older people, like when I see them in the homes, not, not judging anyone, just saying. And she's like, you've got a catheter on, and you're going to have to have a catheter for the rest of your life. I was like, shit, man. That's when reality hit me hard, man. And that's when I took some major, I, I went downhill. Do you know what I mean? I really did went downhill. And I remember looking up online, I think Blackberries were out then. And I just remember having a little uh, iPad when they first come out and I was looking for, to commit suicide and going to Switzerland to commit suicide. Um, Cause you pay 10,000 pound and they give you a pill. That's how much I wanted to really, really get out of it. and. I had some mad dark times in there and I put on a lot of weight. I put on, I come from 21 stone within seven months. I put on 11 and a half stone. I was eating, I was lying about my eating. I was secretly eating, asking people to bring stuff in. I done two and a half years in hospital in total at three different hospitals. I started to think King for four and a half weeks. When they got me up on a bed, this is how serious it is. So they so they uh, physio will get you out an OT on the side of a bed with great help. So you got to remember the embarrassment for me is I got a five foot woman hoisting me out of bed. Do you know what pride that took out of me? That I was getting hoisted of, out of a bed. Listen, man, it's, it's not it's it's something I'm never gonna forget. But it's the experience that I want to grow from, and I'm gonna use it as fuel to always do better because. When I was getting hoisted, my dignity had gone. And every time they hoisted me, my bowels would open because I didn't have no control over my bowels. So I had a catheter put on the side of the hoist. The woman hoisted me off the bed with someone else and then put me on to the, a wheelchair, wheel me down to physio. As soon as I do physio with them, my bowels open again because I've got spinal shock. 
So I'm going through hell right now. Mm -hmm. This is, what life is this? I'm relying on three nurses a day. In the bed, you can smell something, my bowels are open. My bowels are open. It's embarrassing, I don't want to see no one. It got to a point where I turned everyone away from my hospital, then don't come, no visits today. So I hit some dark places. I remember getting a Theraband. A Theraband's what they te teach you to do exercise with your hands, because that's the only thing that's working now. From here, is like my head, shoulders, and my band. So you're doing Therabands. I remember getting a Theraband, tying it to the back of the um, hospital bed. And boy, I just, I just remember yanking my neck, saying, please God, let me go. Please God, let me go. But that's that's the reality of this. So you try to kill yourself? Yeah, uh, twice. And how was your, your dad and mum at that time? Ah, oh, man, they was in bits because I imagine having uh, your son treading your, his mother that I'm going to commit suicide. And then my dad's, my mum's told my dad, by this time I'm in Mayday Hospital, King Croydon uh, University Hospital, and my dad's come up in anger like like I remember when I you know when your dad's angry when you're a child I remember it and he was red eyed he comes storming into my thing he, he put me on like normally I need help to get on a wheelchair he's thrown me on a wheelchair and this is one of the strongest U-turns of life when this is when you need tough love he took me outside in the wheelchair in the rain yeah on the woodcroft wing I'll never forget it and he was so angry. He's like, you want to tell my life, you're my wife, you're going to commit suicide, yeah? Yeah? If you're going to do it, Darren, you do it, yeah? But don't tell my wife that you're going to do it. And I remember him being so angry and his words just trembled through me. And I realised that I can't do this, man. Even the thoughts, to the, the build up to commit suicide, do you know how hard that is? Yeah. To even think, I'm going to pre-predict how I'm going to take my life. But then I've got to think how, what my mum and dad are gonna see when I do this in the hospital and my brother Your and then what they're gonna tell my son. Do you know what I mean? And like all these things ran through my head and I just went, I didn't wanna be here no more. But without him doing that and without my mum telling him, I probably would have tried to do it way more than three times, way more than three times. I tried twice, three, way more than three times that I did mm -hmm. actually, cause I tried. So the Theraband, I wanted to go to Switzerland and then I tried to take a lot of tablets. Not the tablets just gave me a headache. <laughs> so yeah. on top so me trying to commit suicide in the other hospital I, I'll be honest I laugh about it but I just had a big headache yeah. and then by that time I was just like now I'm sitting up here on Tramadol mm -hmm. and the ceiling's going vroom vroom so I mean like I've I've moaned at them saying I want a side room all I complained about is having a side room that was my darkest days man that's one of the things I've never done is having my own side room because I tried to take my life in there with tablets end up with a massive headache for about three days and um you're not on suicide watch or anything no 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 not not at all but i think for me now like i just my message is so powerful i just want to say whatever you whatever you are going through i remember if you are at rock bottom there's only one way and it's up and when you start climbing that ladder and using it as a process more than a negative outlook you're gonna survive and when you get to the, your survival mode, that's in the middle of your survival mode because you're going to take dips. It's how you handle the dips. And for me, I handle my dips well because I just, I, I train myself to um, just, just be around like streams of happiness. And that's, that's multiple streams. And that's not money for me. That's love, man. That's emotion. And like, that's my partner and my son and my mum, my dad, and turn up to the birthdays, to Christmasy stuff that I, every day, every time they have a birthday or Christmas, I feel like it's mine. Cause that's the time where I've, I've got to relive and see you again. So it, it's, it's big for me, man. Yeah, it makes you see the world differently. So different. And I have a lot of people on here that's caused a lot of pain on to others. Yeah. they have got a lot of victims. That's yeah. why I never glorify anybody that's yeah. on because there's always victims. Always, man. You're talking about now you are a victim who yeah. has been shot, who potentially wanted to kill themselves, who <laughs> their son grown up without a dad. Yeah. A dad burying their son, mum burying their son. Yeah. People need to understand the fucking misery that causes by holding a gun and a knife. If you hold a gun and a knife, you are a coward. You are you, a shite bag. You're a coward, Because man. you are so weak that... It is un you've got to understand that they are vulnerable yeah. as well. They're so fragile yeah. that they need to hold that shit to yeah. give them protection, but not understanding the whole fucking ripple effect that it causes. Yes, the misery, the pain, the trauma, the heartache. <sighs> People's lives are destroyed for the rest of their days for the on rest, this planet as well. For, for the rest, you know yeah. what? Do you know what it does? Like, like my 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 vision, my vision, um, hypersensitive, like hypervigilant. It's crazy, man. 
I can't go to somewhere without sitting near a fire exit. Remember, I'm on crutches, I can't run. Why am I trying to run for? I haven't done nothing. I don't have no beef or I'm not in a gang or I don't have nothing. I've never done nothing. So I was a victim of a gang crime. So why should I feel like this? Because someone put me in this position. Yeah. And everyone says, yeah, it's easy to get your mind straight. The word, physically and mentally trying to get your mind straight, that's not the easiest thing. It's taken me a long time and I still do stuff like anxiety. I have, I have like a flashback. So it's a certain light for my lamppost. If I'm driving or I'm walking and it just hits me and, it, and I'm just like, whoa. And I just feel a bit airy, do you know what I mean? And then I start looking over my shoulder, thinking am I going to get shot again? Then the panic taxa comes in. Then I don't know, man. It's like, it doesn't go, but I'm aware of it now. And I'm aware when then dips come, like I said, and, I'm prepared to attach myself to stuff that makes me happy because that's what you need to do. And if you have, if anyone that picks up a knife or gun, uh, I play. I would just pray. Listen, before you go out and do something, there's going to be two victims. It sounds crazy, but there's going to be a victim that took the injury and a person that goes to jail. What you don't realize is both your parents are going to suffer. Yeah, both the parents in this situation are going to suffer because they're going to have a child in jail. Yeah which is rightfully they need to go to jail when they harm someone, but it's not over for them. They get to come out. They get to still have life. They still get to create life. That dead person, they don't get to create life, man. Mm. Do you know what else is sad? I'm doing a lot of mentoring for young kids and um, with Gavin from Reach Every Generation. He's the person that got me on to the, um, the, the mentoring at first. I had done a year and a half with him for free, like going up and down. Just I wanted to change one person's life that didn't happen that changed so many people's life and one of the, there's two hard hitting stories and one was when the guy mess, messaged Gavin saying that he wants to commit suicide because when he got stabbed he had to have a colostomy bag so when he got stabbed he had to get a colostomy bag he said I'm never going to go out beef again and he was calling it a shit bag so I got this shit bag I'm not going to be able to have sex with girls or have a relationship and he was worried about what his friend think as a young age and, and that's what he, that's where he was aiming with it and he messaged Gavin and said I want to commit suicide and for me, that's when I realized I was that person and no bladder, no bowels, no function, no walking. Oh man, I couldn't do it, man. And I'll tell you where the, the biggest U-turn for me, one of my other U-turns was when I was in that room on that tramadol. Somehow my dad and my uncle had just turned up randomly. Remember, I'm in Alsby now, Stoke Mandeville Hospital, um, where it's a rehabilitation center to walk again. I need to say something now that, see the nurses and, and physios, they're heroes, man. Amazing, yeah. Listen, they are amazing. They are real life. They they deserve more than what they what they do. They get you walking. You build relationships with them. They help you. And you're there. They're there. Sixteen hour shifts with you. So sixteen hours a day. Sometimes twelve to sixteen hours a day. You're with them. Then you get a bond with them. Then you realize that they just they're here for their own reasons. They want to help you. It's not just a job for them. And even the ones at Croydon University Hospital, I can't, listen, I speak to them still today. So helpful. And I don't know, man, like uh, there's a time when uh, I was in the physio. So this is one of my turnarounds. So I'm in physio, I'm in my wheelchair. You've got to do wheelchair skills. So big man like me, I'm 32 and a half stone. Now. <laughs> Put on some, wait, I've got a bariatric chair. Yeah, that doesn't fit through the doors. So I can't go home now because I meant to go home now. Um, but my wheelchair, I've got so big, I've had to get a bariatric chair and a bariatric bed. They've got me a bed from America because I'm so big and I can't move. So going back to it, let me go back to the actual progress of it. So at first, so Mayday Hospital, I meant to go down for a catheter, a super pubic catheter at six in the morning. So you're told that you're going to go down in the morning, you're put on a ward, you're going to go down. This is to have a super pubic catheter installed in my stomach. So when I go to wee, it goes straight into a bag that's in, in, a, in a leg bag and that's it. 12 o'clock at night, I wake up. Remember, I'm going down in six hours or five and a half hours. And I'm like, nurse, I need to go wee. She's like, Darren, you're hallucinating because that urine infection, you can hallucinate. And um. I'm like, no, I need to go wee now. I went pressing the bell. She's like, calm down, calm down. Can you just calm down? I said, if you don't come, I'm going to pull this out. She's like, you're going to pull what out? I said, I'm going to pull my catheter out. She's like, you you dare, don't do that, please. Get me a doctor now, I can feel my wee. And I don't know what it was like, I promise you. Like, I could feel I needed to go urine. Like, I needed to wee. So I was like, come, 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 come. Then she's come running over. Remember, and I've pulled this catheter out, not knowing it. <laughs> it's like this long. 
all this blood and urine spilled, gone everywhere. And then she ran over, got me a sick bowl. So I weed and stopped. She's like, how do you do it? That's, that's when I realized I had a mental block. That's right. You, that's through the nurses and physios, their profession, hands up to them, they're, they're brilliant people. But some people telling me, I'm, most people telling me 99%, Darren, you're not going to walk. So you got to remember, you keep telling someone that I'm four months into my... Going to believe it? I'm going to believe it. I know I'm five and, a half, five and a half months in. I'm going to believe I'm not going to walk because you're telling me rest of the rest of your life, hospital bed in your house, wheelchair, social care outside, OT, physio, this, that, the other. You're planning me for the worst. Not knowing that I had a mental block. That's when I started becoming aware of the mind more than anything. So then didn't have the, didn't have the um, super pubic catheter. Started weaning normal. Started weaning into urine bottles. Bowels. Bowels come back within two days of that happening. Then my sexual function come back. And the reason why I say my sexual function like that with so much strength is because a male, that, that's a lot of pride to lose them things. Do you know what I mean? I'll never have a kid again. I will never give life at this rate. It come back. But my legs didn't. So now i am got my functions back, but my, my legs are weak. Like, no, my legs are not moving. So they're still paralyzed. So from my groin, now my legs are not moving. They're, they're paralyzed. They're just sitting there like that. And even my ankles, they're meant to be sitting like they're turned out. So they're having to massage it, whatever, cream it, do whatever every day. And then um, I get to Stoke Mandeville. And Stoke Mandeville is like wheelchair friendly. So you've got to imagine I come from a normal hospital and then I've gone to Stoke Mandeville overnight, woke up and I've met this guy called Dr. Belchi and he's come around, he does his checks. He went up to my leg, he went, done some finger test and pin test, and he went, see you in the morning, you're going to walk. So I was like, what? Dr. Belchi, come back, come back, come back. I remember shouting, he's like, two, got, transport got me there at two o'clock in the morning. I'm, I'm like, what do you mean I'm going to walk? He's like, I have faith in you. And he walked, and I was like, okay, so it gave me a glimmer of light, mm -hmm. but obviously he's one against whatever. And then from that situation there, I didn't walk straight away. Um, it was a long process, but one of one of the processes was you meet your physio, you get your timetable, you have hydrotherapy, you have all these things in place, you go to it. So one was wheelchair skills, one that I never went to, one that I always lost my temper over and said, if I don't see myself in a wheelchair, but I didn't trust the process, I'm not going to walk. And then this is always go back to it. it's a process. And the process was, I had to do this to go further. So I went down to use the wheelchair to drive a car. So in the car park, in the, in the actual physio department, they have a car parked on the side. You have a sliding board, a banana board. So you, you're meant to scoot your bum over like this from the wheelchair over with your arms and just hold it along. Then you get in a car. She goes, yeah, that's how you drive a car. So I remember saying, are you crazy? That's not how you drive a car. Are you, are you drunk? And he's like, please don't be offensive to me, Darren, or you can go. I said, I'm going, I'm going. And she goes, you're not going to do that. She's shouting, he's like, you're going to do your physio and you're going to do it properly. She's like, now move it. So I was like, okay. So I got up, I pushed up, took two steps and sat in the car. And the whole of the physio department has gone quiet. And I'm like, she's like, do that again. I was like, do what again? She's like, do what you just did again. I said, like, what are you talking about? I had stood up. I put my hands on, the, on, on, the, on my wheelchair stood up, took two steps and sat on the edge of the car seat. So I didn't use the banana board. And then that's when I realized that it's the mental block more than anything. And I'm just going with the worst case scenario all the time. So what about if I think about the best case scenario? So then within days, like my leg is, um, it's going crazy that like I've got hypersensitivity. I still have it now. So it's like a fiery feeling. It's called, um, Hyper, yeah, hypersensitivity. So it feels like you're on fire all day long. It just feels like it's going up and down. Your legs are on fire. So I thought, how about if I get pain relief, but try and walk? But in the time when this has happened, I'm 32 and a half stone, put on 11 and a half stone, being in the hospital. How am I going to walk now when I've sabotaged myself and et myself up? I've put on 11 stone. It's not even going to make no sense. So there we. So now back to the process. I had to go back, lose weight. And, and and then start again. So I kind of like went back on my, like, it's, I, I just kept kill, like hurting myself, like self hurt, self -harming. eating. Self harming. Yeah, self harming. So um, getting, putting all that weight on, that was self harm. I just wanted to eat my way out of it, not realizing that I'm stopping the process uh, within. So then I started taking like a couple of, when I mean silly, like little steps, like you're talking step like that, step mm -hmm. like that, and I have to sit down, I'm out of breath. 
I'm walking 10 meters. It's taking me 35 minutes in a physio session. It's crazy. Yeah. How is it talking about getting shot? It hurts, man. I think today's the today's hurt me the most because I've never gone in deep depth like that. Mm -hmm. I've always hit the surface because I feel that I don't know. I feel safe for doing it. But, but this will be a release for you. Yeah. This now, is going out. This will go out to the masses and it will give yeah. people a better understanding, especially talking about killing yourself. Yeah. You wouldn't be sitting here if that happened. No. You wouldn't be going to prisons, schools, helping others. Sometimes we've got to be the pawns in the game to yeah. go to the darkness. You know what? You're strong enough to do it. So you're going to be shitting in a bag. Yeah. You're going to be pissing all over the place. Yeah. You're going to be vulnerable. Yeah. You're going to be weak. But you know what? I know you're going to come through with yeah. strength, power, yeah. honesty. And then you can start changing fucking world. Yeah, start exactly. changing lives, and it's a beautiful yeah. thing. Now you're smiling. Beautiful. Now you're happy. Yeah. You're skipping in here and fucking <laughs> buzzing to do this interview. Buzzing, but buzzing. Looking through all that, the misery it causes everyone else, the oh, heartache, man. the pain. So when you were the night you get shot, was it night or day? Yeah, night time, eight twenty. So if you never started fighting, would you have been? Yeah, away. I would have been gone. Yeah. That's it. I, I, I reckon that they would have just done what they had to do and go. But I didn't see the sense in it because you got the bag. There was 300 pounds. You got Like there was a car key in there. The Louis bag was worth more. What did you gain? So loads, loads of lives ruined for loads. buttons. Loads for, for nothing. Yeah. What was and you, did you, anyone never go to prison? No one. They didn't find no camera evidence, whatever. But it's the way it goes, man. How like, would you feel if somebody came forward and says... It was me that shot you. The old me or the new me? Old me. We'll go with the old new, the old you first. Let me tell you something. You know when you're younger and you've got these so-called, not not so-called friends, but these associates that say they ride or die and whatever. That's all Let bullshit. me tell you, it's all fake, yeah, man. That's all bullshit. And you know what's fake? It's so fake that you think that someone's going to go out that's on your right-hand man or your left-hand man and commit a murder for you. Like, Anyone that's listening to this, I need to wake up, man, because it's not happening, man. Same way they're not going to ride your prison sentence with you. Same way they're not going to ride the losses with you. They're not going to ride yeah. a murder for you. The only yeah? thing and they'll you, be riding is your fucking bud. There you go. Yeah. That, that, that's, that's the reality. And, and there is the few that probably do do it. You're going to get caught. Cool, yeah. There's too much CCTV. There's too much. And you, you deserve to get caught. Cool. You take someone's life or endanger them. Listen, I'm no, I'm no saint, but I will never cause no one no harm. Yeah. And I was, um, me, I'm a man of God and I, I've always been a man of God. I believe in that like, I'm a Christian. I've always prayed. I pray more now because I'm more grateful for my life now and the fruits of my labor and stuff like that. But like, if you ever think someone's going to sit down there and commit a murder, you're crazy. You're, you're off your head. It's not happening. So for me, the, old, the older me, I'd want to get revenge. The new me, I made a pact with God Saying if I am disabled for the rest of my life, which I am, I am partly disabled. I'll be honest. Do you know what I mean? I've had to learn the terms of it. Um, I still have AFOs and walk on crutches. I still fall over, which is embarrassing for me at 37 years of age. But I get back up, and that's the process: is is the getting back up. Yeah, I broke my hip in half through someone calling me a cripple. I didn't like it. Oh, I broke my hip in half, drank silly. And this is where alcohol comes in. I need you to understand alcohol is a drug, man. It's a depressing drug, man. I remember hiding behind the alcohol, like even conversations with loved ones and just saying stuff out of the blue when I was drunk. And I didn't drink till I was 29, 30. So I had a lot to say. You got to remember I'm harboring the, the gunshot and stuff like that. And you're, you're only human, man. We're only flesh and blood, like. No, everyone has it hard when you when you go through a trauma. It's how you handle your trauma. It's what you try, decide to do with your trauma. You can let your trauma drive you down or use that as fuel to go back up to your next level, to, to where you need to be. Me, I use it as energy to go further and spread the message because like the new me, if I saw the person now, I'll ask you why, man. I'll ask you, do you know what it really did to me? The, 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 I'm going to be frank like the pissing on the bed and my pride and shitting myself and not even that the main thing was my family man how how am I still going to tell my son how how you tell me how am I meant to tell a 12 year old boy his dad got shot he, dad, he thinks his dad coming from a motorbike you know what's embarrassing for me there's still the fact that I got shot because I'm not even that character and for you to hold a weapon and and use it against me, it's nuts, man. 
Yeah. You're going to need, to, do you think you'll tell your son one day? Someone else will? Yeah. Do you think it's best coming from you? 100%. It's going to come from me. My bond with him is very tight. He's such a, he's a powerful boy, man. So powerful. Every time I speak to him, Rami this morning, in the way he's like, Dad. I said, yeah. He goes, I'm just getting ready for school. I said, oh man, I love you, man. I said, have a good day. And one day I was speaking to him on FaceTime. I said, what's that in the background? He said, oh, it's a Lamborghini. I said, why? How come you've got a Lamborghini and not something else in your thing? He goes, because I'm going to get one when I'm 20. And you know what? He will, man. He will, whatever he's passionate about. And I'm, now one of his passions is to be a chef. So me, any advice to anyone that you've got a younger sibling or older person, just give them, teach them a skill. If, if they're passionate about something, invest in their passion. Don't force them to be something else that you don't want to do. It's not your journey, it's theirs. And I think a lot of people are... Uh, they live like, you know, you, you, I've got to do what my mum and dad, I've got to be a banker or a doctor. You, no, no, no. Do what you're passionate about. Me, my passion is to open my mouth and be the example of what can and what can't go on if you make it through. Like, I'm truly blessed by God to be sitting here today, to be able to breathe new life and still give life to, yeah. to, to, to anyone. Like, to, do you know what I mean? To have life. Like it's a blessing. I get up every day and some, even though my feet can't feel the ground, I'm like, thank you, God. It's another day. Let's go. I don't care if that's 4 a.m. in the morning because I'm in pain, 5 a.m., but we're ready, man. Like yeah. this, this, is the, this is it. This is where you excel. And I told people all the time, like, just go, man. Like, and it's not, I used to always be like a bit, oh, what do they think if I'm on crutches? Or it used to give me bad anxiety, man. Like, what do they think if he's been shot? And I think one of the biggest things for me is when I was in my wheelchair and I went to a local shop and um, the person said to me, what happened to you? Like an elderly person. And I was like, I got shot. And she went, you probably deserved it. That was a big knock. See that blow yeah. there? That was like getting shot. Because I just faced coming out in a wheelchair, being that weight of 32 stone, you gotta imagine that like, my all pride's gone. I haven't got a haircut. I'm in hospital. They don't, my, like I said, but time and time before, my wheelchair don't even fit on the back of the wheelchair accessible buses. And when it did, when I did finally get to go out the first day, I get told I deserved, I deserved it probably, mm -hmm. just cause I got shot. Yeah. <laughs> when you start doing well in life, one of the best things you can ever do is not caring what other people think, and it's so hard because hard. we're living in a a social media bubble Thank we you. care too much what everybody thinks we want to be liked we want to be noticed we want to have the best of things because we think it's going to buy us a love and attention but it's fake yeah. love it's fake attention it's fake but if man. you never went through all that shit as well you wouldn't be able to be teaching your son yeah. how to visualise in Lamborghinis now out external stuff don't mean yeah. fuck all but it's still good to have good things and have goals and yeah. understand yeah, life a bit more have and desires have when you're goals. working through that then yeah. you started learning how to piss again yeah. and started doing a the toilet there you go now, erections now, and fucking yeah. but once you're over 30 stone how did you get that battle what that was in your was... mind then at that time <sighs> Oh man, that was crazy. I remember saying to Dr. Bell, I remember ringing up my friend Ginge saying, come to hospital. I need you to take me to Alpiton to get bariatric surgery. He's like, what? What's that? So bariatric surgery is where you put um, a um, gastric, band. gastric bypass, bypass mm -hmm. or a band, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was in despair. I went and you know what it is? I, I clicked something. I woke up in the morning and you know when you've got something on your brain, you're like, I've got to do it now. I've got to do it now. It's got, I've got to act now. And that's mm -hmm. always been me. So if it, if the idea comes, I have to act. I don't care what time of day it is, I have to act now. So I woke up in the morning. I was like, I've got to get back to your boat of surgery because if I've got my bladder, bowels and my sexual function back, imagine walking because my legs are just moving just, just a little bit at this time. But imagine without all the weight on and quickly how much I'll get back. So then my mind's doing overtime. Looking, looking, looking. I was like, take me there. So I drove all the way to open. How I got into a full focus, we will never know to this day. All the seats went down. He's managed to get me in the front somehow by... Remember, I wasn't walking in. He's pushed me in with his friend, whatever. I'm 32, so I'm sitting there like this. And <laughs> all, all the way from Owlsby to Open. So you're talking an hour and 40 minutes. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and then I, I like, I'm just like, oh, oh, and we're driving, 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 driving. And I got there, got, to the, got the wheelchair out, got into the place. Like I had to call about five of them to come and help get the wheelchair out. The wheelchair, the boot didn't shut where the wheelchair is so big. Um, and they're like, we can't take money like this. It's a process. You got a book in and you got to come back. You got to weigh your BMI. And then if you're not safe to do it, it's not happening. So with that, with more anger, 
done a U-turn. I wouldn't allow that at a hospital. All the hospitals ringing my ringing my mobile saying, why are you out? Where have you gone? You're not allowed at a hospital because you're high risk because you're shooting. We don't know if it's a revenge attack. I said, all right, cool. Didn't answer the phone, didn't answer the phone. Got back like about 20 miles in, answer the phone. They're like, get back in there. And I said, get back in. And then I go into a bit of depression. Did you feel like a prisoner? Yeah, of course, a hundred percent. Because I come, in, I become institutionalized. So I'll give you an example of institutionalized. So one time, my brother's come to get me, and he's uh, let's go out for a drive. So with the nurses and doctors, they've helped me get in the car. And he goes, "I'm going to drive you down to Mum's." Listen, I cried, man. I had tears rolling down my body. I didn't want him to see. So I kept looking out the window, just going like that, like that, pretending I weren't crying or thing because. I never knew if I was going to sit in a car seat again. And you know, like you could smell your home smell. So when he come, I could smell the washing, the clothes, even though I didn't live at that house at that time, but I could smell my mum and dad and different scenery because I'm so stuck, um, um, bounded to a routine in the hospital grounds. It's like a prison, but you're allowed to, you're allowed to go out side to front and you've got to come back in it's like prison with an injury even though I don't know what prison's like and God forbid anyone that goes there don't go there man because I visited them when I met the kids it's a crazy crazy place um, oh man and I remember getting to the door and my mum just cried and my dad come out and sitting on the drive for the first time in maybe a year and a half and I was like raw. Oh. I remember I couldn't walk over the step. There's a minor little step like that. But I knew that I couldn't walk because I didn't have crutches. At these times, I'm on a bariatric... Um, what's them things called? Bariatric... I forgot what it's called. The bariatric uh, Zimmer frame. This bariatric frame's about as big as this. No lie. You have to walk with it and fold it up and then you walk with it and you stop again. But like I said, I didn't have the confidence to do the step. So time... So after that first time, I went out a few more times. They come and got me and... I remember being in a car and it felt well weird because I'm sitting down at that time, but I can't feel the sitting down. So I could feel like a stump like in my core that I'm sitting down because I still can't feel my legs at this stage properly. My right legs come back a lot more, but I have AFO, so I have no dorsal flexion. So I wear these things underneath that help me walk. I have no core balance, I'll fall over. But wow, like all these things here, you never think you're going to go through this, man. How was it looking at your mum and dad seeing them crying? My dad never, my dad never cried in front of me. Like he, uh, no, sorry, can I rephrase that? My dad's never cried. He's always been like, I remember he come up to me. He's like, what did I tell you from a young age? You're either in the hospital or prison, I'm not visiting you. Hurry up and get out of there. And I think that mentality kept me going. As much as it's strong love, I needed it, man. That was the time I needed yeah, strong you were love. Weak. Yeah, because I was weak. really weak. The only and option I, you had was death. And, and that you was, gave up. That was it. And then, like I said, going back, it's a time where my uncle... And my dad come in and call, come into the side room randomly. They must have just sensed that I was going through a bad stage. And my uncle got his hand. He, my uncle Joe, I look up to him. So he's another role model in my life as well. And he said, he got his hand, yeah. And he said, look at that. So he goes, look at that. Go like this. He goes, what can you see at the end? He said, light. He goes, you're going through the darkest tunnel now. But as you open it slowly, you'll see light. And then once, eventually, you'll look back and you'll see light both sides. He goes, because you're past it but you've got to trust yourself to get through it. Are you man enough to do it? Can you do it? And that's when I realised I need to do it, man. So I got all my wires together, why I need to do it. And I remember going through it every single day. So I remember I was turning up for, not was I just turning up for physio, I was asking them for extra physio or can I do something on the ward at night? And then that's where it become, it come a process, it come a training. I train my mind to do it. And then I stopped the eating the food. I did get a gastric bypass. It's a weird, a funny story how it happened. I said to Dr. Belchi, if you don't get it, I'm going to go and pay for it to get done. Get it sorted, please. I beg you. And he's like, what's, your, what's with your idea? I said, look, at the end of the day, has any spinal patient ever had a bypass and lost weight? He went, no. I said, I'll be the guinea pig. He took it up to the people ahead of him. They got it done in two weeks. But it didn't go the way I thought. I, w I went, I'd lost 10 stone in six months. That wasn't enough for me to walk properly or to walk with any out aids or to even walk without a carer or a person with me. I had to get in a gym, not realizing you still have to work with these things. Then I lost 10 stone. I come to 22 and a half. Then I got outside into a gym. I, I was always an early riser because in the morning they do bloods at 5 a.m. So I wake up at 5 a.m. It's normal now. Um, I got in the gym by six o'clock, easy gym. 
And I started using a um, sit down machine where you just train your arms. And then before I knew it, I lost another seven and a half stone. That's when my walking becomes strong. And how did you start feeling once you started losing oh, weight? Man, started, mindset? How did everybody else treat you as well? I started you? feeling good, man. You know, mm. when you are in shape, oh man, I felt good, man. I just felt so blessed. I thought, you know what? I can do it. I can do it. And it gave me more, it gave me more, it gave me more rope to say, yeah, I've got this. I kept pulling, I kept pulling. Then I got from, I've gone from 5XL to 3XL, 3XL to 2XL, XL to large. And then one time I got in a medium t-shirt. I was like, oh my gosh, I got in a medium. Mm -hmm. So you got to remember, I've been in a medium since I was probably like two. Like, do you know what I mean? Because I've always been like a heavier person. Yeah. So I was, I was gassed that like, I can't lie. Then, then I started telling people like, you can do it if I can do it. And it's not so much I can do it. We all got the inner beast somewhere. We all got the fire in our stomach. Some, it just takes a little while for it to, to flame up and just go, you know what? That word, you know what? I'm going to be real. I've got to swear. That whole word helped me a few times. Like, fuck it. I don't keep like that whole composure when I said it, I knew that was eat time. That was that was the lion within me that I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this for myself. There's no one in this world. And then I started looking good. Then I started getting into track suits and I started feeling myself more. Then I didn't care what people thought. Then I started thinking, you know, what if I can tell people this is the process and trust it? And it started working. Yeah. And now I'm here with you. Yeah, lucky man. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. So once you started getting out, going through all that, so what's the process now of your life? What are you doing now? Because I know you're in prisons and schools. Prisons, schools. How's that then? So how does people treat you that you've been the one shot and a lot of people in prison are so, there for shooting? So, so much respect and light and, and in, in the enlightenment. I have so much engagement through people through through older, younger generations. I have parents that have gone through a, a loss with a child and they just want to talk and just, you know, I, mean, I have a lot of good connections. I have a, like, I have an app, but you know what it is for me, I have a good foundation. So let me tell you about the foundation. So why it's important to have a foundation and I understand it now is if my family um, root is very good. So that's my mum, my dad, my brother, and my son. I've got a beautiful nephew now, such an amazing kid. And then I've got my partner's family and I've combined it, the families together. So my foundation is so strong, yeah, that I've, that I've got and my partner's been through so much with me and I can't even lie do you know what she, she's a powerful girl and at certain times I'm a bit moany but you know what it is I get through it but I'll give it to her she's really pulled me through because when I got with her I was doing negative stuff and just thinking negative and her outlook's always been positive but her brothers and sisters they're, they're, they've really helped me too and her mum and I think for me so where I've gone forward now is I've made sure my foundation's so strong that anything after it can only get stronger. So for my fam so for my God, my meditation, my family, they're so they're so important to me in the mornings. Like I, I look through stuff and my aunties, my uncle, I make sure that I'm at every family event. So from there I can just excel in everything I need to do. And I haven't got to worry about if something at home's not right or if something on my other like left side is not right. Because it's all right because I've gone back in time and made it okay because and it's important to have then conversations with people, even when they're hard, like the communication between your friends, like even my circle of friends, is completely changed, man. Like I, I, some of the stuff that I would be having a conversation with people, it's nothing personal, but I don't indulge in them conversations. I don't find it funny and I just want to go. I want to leave, you know, when the energy's gone. It'll drain you. Yeah, it's just like a drainer then. I, and I'm polite. I don't tell them that. I just, I, I remove myself and go about my business. And I tell you what, another key thing is for me, gym. It's therapy, man. It's so much therapy for me. That is one of my biggest therapy ever. That is movement's medicine. And um, if without the gym, I don't know where I'd be. Yeah, I've seen some of your videos. Very inspirational, yeah. brother, sitting there with a the sledgehammer, hitting the yeah. tires. And but you know how that come about? That's down to the Brixton Street Gym, the Terrell and Ben. But the reason why that's so important, because no other gym does it. Who caters for adaptive seated, pe seated exercises? They do the one gym in the whole world or the whole of UK at least that doesn't discriminate against disabled people or people with a disability because what other gym do you know that you can feel I've never felt comfortable in all the gyms I've been going the easy gym the David Lloyd's the Beckoner I mean the spa gyms everything I've just been like that I feel like they look at you but in that gym they help you so it, you, so as soon as you stop someone else picks up and helps you 
it's like the energy is crazy. Yeah. So you were in the hospital for two and a half years. Two and a half. What was it like when you get told you were fucking leaving? Get out, man. Oh, they was happy because yeah. I, I had a bad attitude. You remember yeah, pain I had in the ass. Oh, pain in the Nurse, nurse, mm -hmm. every minute, nurse. Mm -hmm. He's like, Darren, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. But then I started becoming independent, like independent on myself. So it got better and it got, it got do you know what? The last three months of hospital, you know what saved me? Being, being, putting on that weight because I got an extra... <laughs> extra year in there because they couldn't house me <laughs> so look at that look at the irony like yeah. putting on all that weight gave me extra a year's extra physio because i couldn't be housed because my wheelchair is not going through a standard i think the wheelchair was 38 something centimeters wide a door a standard the biggest door frame is 22 so then they finally got me out you know how they finally got me out they put me in a hotel travel lodge the wheelchair just fitted through but <laughs> they took my wheelchair and they even gave me a shower chair and said don't come back you cause us so much trouble. <laughs> yeah, shouting on the wards, being boisterous, but they love me then. Mm -hmm. I built a good relationship. I speak to a lot of them now and uh, man, they're, they're heroes, man. The people are amazing. They don't get paid enough. The nurses, no, they, my mum works for Cordia as well yeah. and they're getting in and they clean up shit and piss. Somebody <laughs> farts, I can fall out with somebody for doing that. <laughs> yeah, do you know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah do you know what I mean? Um, for for the people to do that and actually yeah. get up every morning and try to help others and save lives, it's it's yeah. phenomenal. They are the real superheroes. The, the super yeah. like, and and they don't get paid. They're tired. I've mm -hmm. seen when they're tired. Twelve hour shifts, I, eighteen hour shifts of lifting people that yeah. are like two, three and times this is their women size. in their fifties and sixties. There you yeah. go. There you go. And yeah. I, I believe they do it because something may happen in their life, or they just really care. Because you can't do that job for that money. And same with teachers. I don't teachers are more than the teacher in schools. The most schools I've visited, they're mentors, man. Do you know what it is? When I look back now, I wish I learned more at school because I'm not saying I would have been brainier, but if I just listened instead of talked all the time. Yeah, you think you know everything at that age. Yeah, you do. You think you know it all. Yeah. And I, my dad used to say, just listen, stop talking. Stop talking, you'll get the answers. Listen to who you when you're with someone or the teacher telling you something, all the answers just listen. Yeah. I wish I did it. How was your heart in that when you started putting on weight? Was uh, it, did, you, did you do any tests or that? And no, I was, I had a lot did of... Did your dad never say to you, listen, no, he was always get saying, your shit together? Yeah, like, get it together. Darren, sort it out. Sort it out. And he's, he, like I said, his words were like a box around the face. So when he said that, I was like, okay, he don't matter what age, even now, he will say, he's, like, my name a certain way. And I'm like, oh, yeah, cool. Because, you know, at the end of the day, I respect him. and They're the only ones that they're when the shit yeah, hits the fan. There you go. And, and that's, listen, who, let me tell you something now. All these associates, 60, 70 people, 80 people, I didn't see you after the three days of my hospital, man. I still ain't seen people now. So all the people I didn't think were going to be there, they're there. So reverse role. So all the people that I thought were the heroes and the bad boys and this, that, the other, no, they disappeared, man. They got me their life. They went out clubbing. They lived their life. They went home to their families. You know who's to pick up the PCs? The people that I used to run from, my mum, my dad, my brother. Ha! Yeah. Everyone else. That's, that's the way it is. And I think it's crazy to think that the people that you think are going to be there, they're not there for you, man. What do you think of people that's in gangs just now? I think get out of it, man. Like, don't ever be afraid. Just just, just just take a right turn and be like, I'm not doing it no more and get out of the gang. And if you can't, just please tell someone, man, because what you're going to realise is I witnessed that so many people get done with joint enterprise and let's say there's five people involved. Sometimes the other three or four, they're not really involved. They're just there, but they're going to go down for this simple word called I'm not snitching and you you got to think, man, you're, it's going to affect your family. Not only that, a lot of these talents, you know how much kids, even women, are picking up knives now. Like, you know how much talent there is? And like, I feel that there's so much talent. They, the outlets they have, we never had. They've got Instagram. That is TikTok, um, TikTok or Snapchat. Snapchat, Facebook, but they can, And you got the young Asian boy, I got referred to him because his parents were buying him toys. He's worth seven mil for opening a toy and explaining what it felt like in his hand. So there's so much positive outlets and opportunities for these kids to go further and so much clubs for football and the girls the horse riding and the makeup artists and even girls well Arsenal girls play better than Arsenal actual football <laughs> like men like, do you know what I mean so there's so much positive outlets and don't let the internet fool you man don't don't let social media fool you because half the people in there that floss all these watches and that they ain't got that they, they're not they're going down the jewelry shop getting sponsored to wear a couple of watches for the jewelry shop to pick up and say, oh, look, yeah, I've got this watch today. Listen, 
I, Apple Watch is the best watch I've probably had. I've had a Rolex. Got it. Done that. The way Apple Watch is, keeps me fit. It keeps me going. Track it keeps your steps. Me, my steps. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's a, that's, that's my addiction. Uh -huh. Do you know what I mean? And I think, don't get caught up with, um, I have to go back to chasing money. You know what currency is for me? It's love. Like I said, it's love. It's an emotion. It's an upskill. Help someone around you and don't always, don't be afraid to lend a hand and, or a conversation or open ear or heart for someone because you never know what they're going through, man. And no matter amount what money I get, if I, if I get two, three million pounds now, if you say to me, Darren, you know what? I got this much. Here, it's not going to make me happy, man. You know what's going to make me happy? You teaching me a skill or helping me get further in something that I'm passionate about. Because money comes and goes. But if you're the flow of money, it always comes. So you've got to change your narrative around the currency. And currency for me, like I said, is just being there at an event or being around someone that's their energy. That's more than any money you can buy. And with that, I'm not saying money can't buy things, but I'm saying that money's going to come and go. Yeah, our upskill will get you further or love or an emotion. Like, a lot of people lack love and they're scared to say it. It's sad, man, that how much people commit suicide, but especially men, because they can't just speak up and say to their partner, I haven't got the money. So they rather commit suicide or my mum or their mum or dad, I, I can't do this no more because I'm not doing this no more. But but please, man, just just talk to someone, man. Because yeah, it's difficult. How when you were trying to kill yourself in the hospital, what was going through your mind five minutes, ten minutes before? And that I'm making it better for everyone around me. I'm not a burden. Yeah, it's sad to think that, isn't <laughs> it? But you don't really. It doesn't really take away your pain. What it does is pass it on. There you go. So then mm. that comes back to how much more trauma I'm about to put on my loved ones again. How much heart felt heartache can they take? They blame themselves, maybe. There you go. They couldn't have and, and it's nothing to do with them. And, yeah. and I appreciate every person that has been there through my journey, even the ones that fell off, because you made my journey. And I don't ever regret that. As human beings, but we're just ungrateful. Yeah. But it's, you, you really appreciate life more when you, you're at death's door. Yeah. When you get fuck all to live for. Listen, when you've got nothing. Yeah. That's when your come up comes. But yeah, we've all got the currency to change the world, to make yeah. great strides to a better are. life, a happier life, a Thank more successful you. life. But some people don't realise that. Yeah. Your prime example that until you were actually shot, paralysed, shitting everywhere. There you go. That you never really look, realised look how good your life was. I didn't really, I didn't realise getting up and going to the top of the cupboard in the hospital and getting a pair of socks was privileged, man. Yeah. <laughs> I missed... I, I realised sitting in a wheelchair not moving and oh man I remember my feet not moving and I remember I remember they used to say to me just sleep. when you go to sleep at night send the messages down and I was like how do you send a message down to something that's not working but it works man mm -hmm. it really does work and you got to remember no matter what dark place you're at and when you're going through something um, man, I'm a man like I said it's by faith man I'm on my knees praying even though I can't feel it sometimes and I know God's got me, but my God's going to be different from other people's gods or how they think of it. But I know he's got me, man. And like I said, it's just the people. You like, my biggest thing is be around people, circles. And whatever you're feeding, your, whatever you feed, your, feed yourself is in food-wise, make sure you're feeding food, your thoughts in your mentally. head as well, mentally as well, because yeah. they're the ones that count, man. And mm -hmm. be cautious of what you're doing. And don't always say yes to people. You're allowed to say no. It's not a pressure. I've learned the hard way of saying no, it hurts to say no. I, I like saying yes. So if you say, yeah, can I walk four or five times? Yeah, I'm there. Mm -hmm. Oh, can I come here now? Yes, I'm coming now. I outrun, my, I burn myself out. It's because I feel that I want to help so much people because I see so much people that if you just tweak it for them or help them with that, just that little thing, they'd be on the right path. And that's come from just, just having that heart, man. Yeah, what's your daily routine like now? Oh, it's, it's my daily routine. So I get up in the morning, pray for 20 minutes, meditate for about 10 then I go down and use, uh, I go, I'm always in the gym. So every day is like a 900, Monday to Friday, 900 to 700 calorie, 700 to 900 calorie burn. Uh, eat, well, I don't eat meat um, because I've watched that fridge for farms and I've been aware yeah. of what I eat because the hormones that goes into what, your body. health and stuff. Yeah. I watched yeah. that and I ended up vegetarian for two years. Yeah, see, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, so I'm pescatarian six mm -hmm. years. Yeah, I'm not now. I did, yeah. I did a documentary last year, I eat chicken yeah. now, but I'll go, plant-based next year yeah. I, I yeah, just feel as if I should be doing it yeah, I'm gonna I just feel it. as if it's laziness yeah, it gives um, you a healthy uplift yeah, there's something I, within I'm you just making excuses because it's 
it's hard to cook. It's, yeah. it's excuses. It's not hard. Yeah. It's just yeah. it's easier just to go across the road and it get is. shit. There That's got, all yeah. it is. I just I believe I will go plant based. I think yeah. it will take me to another level mentally. No, hundred one million. Yeah. It open new doors for you. So you're eating good then. Eating good and be what around you now. So um, so I'm on. So I'm in between. So. Monday to Friday is straight veg, mm -hmm. like veg pack with either tuna mixed in it, um, vegan sausages, which is shroom sausages. Um, and they do like a tea car sausage, uh, tea car slices. So that's Monday to Friday. Cheat day is Saturday or Sunday. will be a pizza, Thai or something like that. But obviously pescatarian, mm -hmm. so it'd be fish. And just spending time with my loved ones and attaching myself to the happy people around me like that bring me like power like I feel like you bring me good something energy. energy yeah that's what are you smoking is. weed or anything in through nah. your dark days no 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 weed I tried CBD oil how was that for your anxiety it's or horrible. anything yeah I don't know I don't know what anything externally I don't believe yeah. to try and cut out I don't take coffee I don't do anything that, anything that stimulates my mind no. I want Someone to do told it physically me about Reiki Re yeah I do Reiki, Reiki yeah. Okay, what, so so it's, like healing, it's like healing energy yeah so they say it's like energy everything's your chakras as well everything's yeah. energy okay, yeah. so when you become, if you're eating shit, drinking, taking drugs, if you're doing bad shit, everybody's got an aura. So it yeah. like pokes holes in it, lets all the negativity okay. come in. Everything's pure energy. Yeah. So I've been having a acupuncture. I've never mm -hmm. tried it. We've been so against it. Why am I going to put acupuncture when I can't feel um, my legs properly, but my legs are hurting internally? I've been doing acupuncture and he's been burning something. He calls it um, birthday cake. They burn something on top of the needle with, and it's been helping. And like I said, just touching myself to my loved ones and good people. Like I met Murray. You wouldn't even believe Murray. I've met. Like, shout out to Murray. Shout out to Murray. Mm -hmm. yeah, three Big weeks. fan of the podcast. Yeah. I must as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, just, just being like the right energy and the right people have been coming around. And I think when you got that pastor said something to me in church and he said it three times in a row. And the last time he said it to me just before lockdown, it is the most powerful message for me. He said, some of you, and some person in this church today is holding a door open while this other door is ready for them. But the more you're holding this door open, not closing it, thinking that your old routine is going to work for you, you're wrong. Till you shut that door, this door will not fully be open. And I went home with that message and I thought, I'm clearing out everything. So within my phone, within my space, within my mind, I cleared it out. I stopped talking to a lot of people and contacts. No lie, within a week, I thought the message for me and through God and that doors have just been open continuously yeah, you must cut out that poison it has listen to. to your phone calls yeah. are, are they enhancing your life are you feeling better there you go if they're not you must grow the strength and yeah. say no I need to come back yeah. people will hate on you yeah. they will talk shit about you but then whether they're ever really your friends whether they're really your supporters yeah. of course they weren't yeah. but people do get annoyed when you come back and take a step back because exactly. they feel as if you forgot yourself or why are you doing that? You think you're better than me. It's not. I just want yeah. change. And to create change, you must do things differently. You have to. And you have to have a creative change and a creative focus. Do you know what I mean? I've met a lot of people via my... This is why you've got to use your social media properly. It's your brand. It's your social media. You control it. So if someone's trolling you, block them. If someone's being rude to you, block them. You don't, you don't have to give them that energy. When you unplug... They don't like it. Yeah, when you when interact, you, that's right. You're fucked. Yeah, your day is fucked. Two, go, three days. There you go. And you're yeah. just, you're going around in circles. And the, the the thing is with social media, for me, I just want to buy my videos. And by the way- What I, is your social media for people to tune in just now? Literally just for um, AWOL underscore motivation. It's literally just to give you upliftment and give you courage to say, look, whatever you're doing, there's a process to it. Keep doing it. Because when you're through that process, you're going to look back and be like, it's worth it. And just don't stop, man. And like, like keep going what does AWOL mean so your second name AWOL so it's a way of life motivation but obviously my surname's Awolesi so I've just shortened the AWOL um, out of my name and put it into things because it is a way of life and I remember my dad gave me a record bag uh, ages ago and it said AWOL do you remember the old record bags that used to wear to school? Well, yeah. Claude yeah, so you're not, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's where I got it from. And ever since, you know, like, I just see it. I just see it everywhere. Like, I see AWOL. I see a lot of numbers as well. I see a, it's weird. I see a lot of three sevens everywhere I go. Like, I always see a seven or a three. But that signs from people say angels or whatever. Yeah. You're protected, I'm protected. We're yeah. on a path. And 100%. I'm taking things to fucking new heights. Yeah, what levels. you've done is amazing. Yeah, like, thank you. Like, it's powerful, man. And I've seen a lot of your work and 
it's consistent, man. And it's consistency better every single time. You, yeah. you level up all the time. That's all you've got to keep doing. Yeah. And I always say, if you think you've made it, you've only took two steps back. I question, though, yeah. why I'm doing it, what I'm doing. Yeah. There was a time I was the craving the attention of it, but yeah. now you, you realise it's bullshit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the money, the materialistic things, I always promote it as yeah. bullshit. Don't yeah. get me wrong, it's nice to have luxury if you've worked hard, but appreciate it I, yeah. I, I do genuinely appreciate it yeah, I yeah. drove about in a 300 pound Mazda for yeah. two years yeah, I actually so broke know. down a few weeks ago driving back from Manchester <laughs> so coming up yeah, the motorway yeah, yeah. just went yeah. um, oh, a Friday shit. night we were driving back from Manchester yeah. me and Nick yeah. broke down left it in the motorway yeah. 991 picked yeah. it up I said just crush it yeah, just and that was it. that I got a new motor a couple of days ago yeah. it's a bit better a bit of luxury but yeah, do you know I what I that. fucking earned it yeah. I've yeah, worked of course you do. Yeah. but yeah it is all bullshit. Yeah. I just want uh, the finer things in life, everything with Finn. Have a, yeah. a happy medium. Yeah, that, that, I ain't a saint. I don't promote. Listen, I'm a fucking golden child. Same, same I way. still fuck up. I still get angry. I still feel like kicking fuck out of people. I st- no matter how much I meditate, I'll drive and I'll think, I'll fucking Trigger. kill that cunt. Yeah, yeah, and I don't yeah. know why I do it. Yeah. And I think, you're doing that thing yeah. again, James. My yeah. mind can go a wandering yeah. for five, ten yeah, minutes. It, listen, just like that. Yeah. Just like that. One, one, one hurdle can send it into that. One yeah. hiccup and you're there say with me but do you know what I mean it's just like like you said it's, it's about when you're taking that dip mm-hmm. how to handle it you can admit your, like I'll take a dip that like today I was in a rush and me I'm, I'm a man that wants to get here do this do that do that but it is it, you it's need gonna to slow work it down out. when the universe puts it in yeah. place it will happen at the right time yeah 100% so looking back in all your life looking back at the night you were shot do you forgive the person who shot you yeah 100% how hard was that for you hard because I the I say the the new not the new me but the three years ago me I probably would have just wished bad stuff now but I only wish is bad upon yourself there you go that it's a reflection the, of yeah, what that you releases take the poison yeah. inside you holding on to that pain yeah. holding on to that resentment what if this and playing it over yeah. and over and over that only kills you not yeah, exactly. the person who done it never does karma always wins in the end always so no always. what anybody and the worst done, is even though karma always wins, I don't wish karma on you, man. Yeah. I wish you happiness. I turn my back on it. You know why? Because I've I've hit it face on. And if every problem that I get now, instead of going around the problem like we all do as humans, I face it head on. The person who done that could be potentially watching. There if he go. was watching right now, would, what would you say to him? Thank you. Just have, just make sure that next time when you do something that you're not doing it, do, just don't do what you did to me in it. Like think first. Like before you pick up a gun or a knife or you think you're going to endanger someone's life, it's not just my man, it's my family and my loved ones and everything I do, the actions and the anxiety. Because it's not just the physical pain, it's the mental pain. The mental pain is going to kill you nearly. Like my mental pain nearly took, imagine that I took the physical pain, but mentally it was killing me. So I'd, I wouldn't, I'd just think first, man. And is it worth it? No, it was never worth it, man. And it kills your dad, kills your mum, kills your son, there you your go. brother. And He's so on. already felt pain and losing my a aunties, one. my uncles, yeah. the 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 the, so, the few friends I friends I do have. And you know what it is? It's only going to come back to you. But like I said, I don't wish it. But listen, just think first, man. And a message to anyone that thinks picking up a knife or guns cool or brandishing it or rolling around with it, you're scared. Yeah. If you can't physically, I'm not saying fight, but if you physically cannot have a one-on-one with someone, you shouldn't be having these fights, but you're not a man if you can't fight. Yeah, you're a pussy. Yeah. It's as simple as that. And I know you're plenty not, of friends like, and bad men and yeah. who've done that shit and yeah. I'll tell them they are yeah. pussies, you're yeah. fucking weak. Listen, if I can have a fair fight if you beat me up, you're a man, mm-hmm. yeah? I'll shake your hand. If you pick up a weapon while we're fighting, you're a pussy. Yeah. That's the truth. Million percent. So going through all your life, first of all, it's amazing what you're doing, no, achieving, you, losing man. the weight, kicking on. Yeah, try to, we don't stop, man. Yeah. It, so looking back at it all, obviously it brings back a lot of emotions, yeah. but going forward for the future with yourself, what's the plans for Darren? So the plans is is to, well, I've got a life coaching um, website and company that started. I also got a podcast that's going to be Taxi Talk. So I've got a London Taxi, right. wrapped it in bright blue. Mm-hmm. It's called Hashtag Taxi Talk. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, Hold on. Yeah, hashtag taxi talk. So basically, yeah, we're going to go around whole conversations in it and then you're going to come in. I'll I'll be there, brother. I'll be there. (laughs) Yeah. We'll leave all the links to the description and stuff. So how are you feeling, brother, talking about all this madness? I feel like the... I always feel like I wait off from my show, but for this time, I feel like the weight's off 
my shoulder because I've never gone into deep, de deep depths and show people. Some people, I've told them about it because I just want them to know that some people that, you know, when they're around you and they might be doing certain things, I've shown them the realness. I've shown them the, the, what I went through. Just as an example, I'll be the example of what can happen. So just take, take the turn and forget about it. Don't like turn it over cheek. But for me, like, I feel better now, man. I feel that I needed this to do and this was the right time. Weight off your shoulders. Yeah, 100%. How's your dad see you now? No, he's good. <laughs> my dad probably, you know, it's, I think, I think as a dad, you probably still, that's still my little boy. Like mm -hmm. how I see my brother is my little brother. But he's he proud he's of you now? Yeah, I, love, I, I hope to... Does he not, say it? Does he's, it proud, he's, proud yeah. he's proud of me. He's proud of me. He's proud of yeah. me. He is because he says to not me... Not a man who shows his emotions No, much. no, he keeps it close to his heart. Yeah. But I know he loves me, man. I mm -hmm. definitely know my mum loves me too. Uh, yeah. I think my mum, my mum, yeah, definite, definite. And like, like, like I said, like my partner, her family. So this was them. a partner before you got shot as well? No, this is the partner. After? After, so this person... You still in the wheelchair and stuff? And yeah, got with, with me through my... In, through me falling over, me going through depression, through me being in the house, um, you name it, having to help me urinate. Yeah, that's a lot for house. someone. Um, she got me after the injury. So I've known her since I was uh, 16. And uh, now I've been with her six years. So yeah, and that's it. And then i got to say my cousin as well um, and her family's been so supportive and I've grown, I've always been very close to her. But we're very close. Like, we're so close now. It's unreal. And they're powerful people around me. You're born stronger with the ones yeah. who are there when you needed them the most. There you go. And that, and that's what it is. Yeah. So, you, but you got any prisons and stuff now? So, yeah. yeah, I've been doing... So, a lot, loads, I've been three prison visits two, and secure visits. I've been mentoring four kids in Aylesbury with, uh, they're with social service um, as well. So, that's I've been doing that for a year. And on top of that, I've been doing, a, I've done a few schools in London. I've done about 120 schools. And um, yeah, just, just showing them the realness that just don't get caught up, man. You're, you're not called to be in a gang. A gang for me is Arsenal, even though I, they're a crap team. But mm -hmm. that, that's the truth. But that's a gang for me. That's, a, that's a, a nice gang. And getting in a gang doesn't make you strong, man. It means you've got probably a group of, like I said before, four or five people that are weak and one's leading it because he knows you're vulnerable. What is it? There's four or five people running. Being groomed. Yeah, that's what it is. And the sad thing is, uh, in one of my mentoring things, um, is uh, these, I don't rate anyone that does this, that you've got these guys going, they call it county lines. You're getting the young 10 year olds, you're buying them trainers. Um, you're giving them 50 pounds to plug kindergarten eggs up their ass. My friend, you're being raped. Yeah, that that's rape. Yeah, that that that's not cool, man. You can't. That, uh, kids at the age of ten are going up to Wales and these countries on count. They're called the county lines, plugging dr drugs to drop up for the older people. That's not cool, man. That's gonna be that's someone's child. And if that splits into their anus stream, the, their bloodstream is gonna go into anus and they're they're gonna potentially die. Like think about it. And just because they're giving you fifty pound a pair of trainers, use your brain. You're being brought. They own you. So for the minute you pick up that trainer or that money, they own you. That's the sad thing about it, man. For anybody watching that's maybe going through the struggle, yeah. maybe stuck in a wheelchair or yeah. going through depression or in, maybe involved in a gang, what advice would you give for them? Mate, just mate, if you're in a wheelchair and you're at that point, whatever your life looks like, just remember your darkest days uh, can be your brightest days. You need to get your mind around it. And like I said, just, just don't stop, man. And when you stop, that's when you give up, man. And I don't want you to stop. And if you're involved in a gang, like I said, don't do it, man. Lady, uh, girls and boys or men and women, just just stop stop and think, man, because you're going to be have repercussions. Just because you do something and get away with it today, don't mean it won't come back and bite you. People don't forget. Yeah, uh, That's it. And I just think that you need to have an open mind of what you're doing to someone else's sibling. Mm -hmm. Dan, no, thank you, man. For coming on today, Powerful, brother, and telling man. your story. Oh, Proud of you, yes. what you're doing, mate. Making changes. I know she's trying to sneeze. Yeah. Just let it out. Don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> just uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's um, it's phenomenal. No, thank you. The things that you've done, pushing forward. Yeah. For the wheelchair and in the hospital, trying to kill yourself to yeah. now go to gyms, going round schools, going yes. round prisons, changing lives. Fair play to you, brother. Oh, and you I look so forward much. to seeing the rest no, of your thank journey. Thank you again. Thank God you so bless much. You, mate. Thank Take you, man. Care. God bless.
Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.